Yeah, I, I'm going to leave that on YouTube. Just my change dropping in the background as the episode finishes. <laughs> You're a buttload. Mods ban him. Getting mods don't agree with him. At least don't agree with him. <laughs> All right, let's begin. I think perhaps we should recess for a short while until the evidence is brought forth. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. Hum, disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Van Ziggs. This is nothing but a smokescreen. A Nippony specialty, as it would seem. What are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. That this witness's intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGildred at the pawn brokery. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles are value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of stealing such a commonplace property. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGilded perished two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of this trial. A trial at which he was found not guilty. A trial at which it was established he was in the upstanding member of society's reputation implied, in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. This article at upstanding member of society pawned was entirely ordinary. A black overcoat just happened to have a music box disc in one of its pockets, and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if a man tried to make a gift of such things to me. You know, that does make a rather a lot of sense. It's not as if it was gold or jewels, is it? Though goodness knows Mr. McGildred was rich enough. But you can't deposit such cash at a pawnbroker, it's quite certain of that. The prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is inconvenient to the defense now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles upon by this fine citizen would have. Well, counsel, is your argument in fact demonstrable? Are you able to show proof that the disc or box contained any tangible way related to the case? Well, what's the matter, Runo? We know that they're related, don't we? They're both vital pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. You and I both know that. We know McGilder's true character, and we know that this disc is significant, but even if even if we don't know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we'll have to acknowledge that McGilder's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense's argument was flawed, based on false information. Oh no. And that would mean admitting that Gina committed perjury. But Kenny. Could it be that Van Zeek knows? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything. But maybe. This could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry? What do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Runo? Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Every time. All right, the exact significance of the things that McGilder deposited with Mr. Windybank is something only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about to that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? Ooh, shit. I need to know now, does this game have two different endings? I feel like it's better to have her not testify. Fuck. Whoops. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? While the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGilder's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? 
To what end? It's to do with the various articles deposited when he makes by Mr. McGildred, my lord. Miss Lestrade has information relating to them. I believe it will be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. I will prove the significance of these articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are becoming interesting. I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused's standing, and indeed your own. I have. Lord Van Zeeks. Would you care to explain the last remark? If the prosecution accepts a defensive proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well, if you have no objection. So the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. The witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Then I shall bid you good day. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Miss Lestrade testifies. As you wish. All right then, Gina. It's time. I know this will be hard, but please put your faith in me here. Good luck, Bruno. The articles that Mr. Gilded had deposited when he makes pawn brokering are intimately related to the Omnibus case, the trial of which we heard at the courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGildred. The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. And now here we all are again, the same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Allow me to recap the events two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGildred. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder, in fact, took place above the defendant's head on the roof deck, with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Miss Lestrade whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage, open at pickpockets and unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted into the murder, Mr. McGilder died this very courtroom in the most extraordinary circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now. Two months ago, as indeed the omnibus murder itself. Be that as it may, I recall neither the disc nor the small box being mentioned in the court, course of those proceedings. Miss Lestrade. Would you tell the court now, please, what really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean? I don't know what you mean. I already said all of what I know. And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Please, Miss Lestrade. This is extremely important. But, remember, little girl, if it transpires that you will will willfully withheld information in a trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. And naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts, you have little credibility to lose. Ginny, don't listen to him, please. You have to test trust Runo now. Iris, we're on your side. All right, then. I'll talk. It's the right choice, Gina. Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell-bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about, it, about its ears. So be it. I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGilder's pawned articles and that extraordinary case on the omnibus harbor secrets of which have been hitherto un unaware. So, Miss Lestrade, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth, a comedy sorely lacking in your original statements. Trust, this is it then, everything's going to come out. Like Van Zeke said, 
This court could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk. Truth is, the Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. When the Irish man dragged me out from under the seat, I saw the disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scream from over in my head, and the pair on the roof deck went off to actually call the slops. Then when McGilgut slipped the driver and some tin to do a run of the pawn shop roundabout, he threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I seen or heard. Good grief, this is outrageous. What you just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then there is every chance I may have educated an area in McGilgut's trial. I sounds very much to me as a man deliberately deceived this court, in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The act of the accused in the trial of this witness and my learned friend are certainly inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was a farce. It was all lies. The McGilgrid fellow was robbed to the court, just as like that pickpocket. Don't forget the lawyer from the East. They were all in it together. You're wrong, a lot of you. Mr. Nadahodo, the lawyer there, didn't know nothing about it. Humbug. I don't think so. Are we really expected to believe that? He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? What an operation to get the man and scoff free. Unforgivable. Stop. The lies have to stop. Stop. <laughs> yes. The defense made a, t a terrible error of judgment. I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it is imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony. Because the true significance of McGilder's pawned articles must be brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Student friend? Given the depths of your calamity you have just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. Words family, this situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Narahodo. Yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. Blimey, Mr. Narahodo. Now, counsel, proceed with cross-examination. Truth is, the Brickmaker Cove was in the cabin of the Omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw the disc on the floor. We're just gonna elaborate on everything. And you were holding in the cabin that night of time as well, weren't you, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats. Yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. He's, uh... Why is he conspiring? Why, why are they doing this? Now, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claimed Mr. Grildred was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. That's... That's what I told me I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Were Mr. McGilded and the victim acquaintances? I don't know. But I did hear him talking a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well. But if I had to say... I think it was about money or something. They kept talking about buying and not buying. Perhaps business dealings of some kind. Yeah, but that's very fishy. I, I feel like... Something is about to unearth here. Anyway, they got louder and louder. It started to sound like a proper fight. It's pretty scared by then. I hardly dared to breathe. And then, all of a sudden, I heard a noise like someone keeling over on the floor. That was blooming loud at all. And I believe you let out an involuntary scream. Yeah. That what gave me away. When the Irish man dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. Hold it! Was the disc you saw this disc? Yes. I reckon it probably was. I was right next to the cove lying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but Mr. McGilded picked it up pretty smartish. And then sat on the cove with a knife with his belly up on the seat. What did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about what I seen or heard of no one. About the disc and all. I was dead scared the way he was looking at me. I thought, if I didn't go along with it, I get stuck with that knife, too. Hmm. Then he started asking me a load of questions. Like what my name was, where I lived, and that. He asked me about being a diver, too. 
But after a while, what had happened to the carriage was noticed. Yeah, that's right. First, there was a kind of rapping noise. All of a sudden, I heard a screaming over me and impaired the roof of the deck when all the cobbler slumped. There were two gentlemen occupying the seats on the roof deck, I believe. Yeah, that's right. They must have looked down through the skylight and noticed the, the cove with a knife in its guts. When they screamed, the diver pulled up the horses and McGilditch got me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to a halt, the two coves ran from the... Ran from the roof, ran off to fetch the shops. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear they were entirely unrelated to the incident. So that left Mr. McGilder, the driver, and you still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there because I was under the seat. I heard the cabin door open and the voice from outside. The diver, yeah. He also testified at the trial, I believe. A fellow went by the name of Beppo, a memory serves. What did Mr. McGilden and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened. And stuff like that, mainly. That's when Mr. McGilden slipped the driver some tin to do a run to the pawn shop in a roundabout. That pawn shop obviously being Windy Banks on Baker Street. Just a moment, counsel. Do you mean to tell me that the driver gave false testimony in the trial as well? Perhaps the excursion to the pawn brokery slipped his mind when he was in the stand. Indeed, Lord Van Zeeks. McGilda took off his coat and gave it to the driver. He folded it up all carefully like before it, and handing it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking, that coat and what's in it, it's gotta be worth a few bob. Yes, Dina was sure that this must be worth more than Mr. Winterbanks had suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the place that afternoon in the pawn broker. The driver looked pretty happy when McGilda flashed him brass in the face and went running off a lick. Then he bought Carter called me and told me to come out of the drag's cabin. He threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I seen or heard. Hold it! Threatened you? How, exactly? He told me I'd only been able to scarp her as I did exactly what he said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Yes, that's it. And there was this one other thing he said, which was... He told me I'd have to hang on to the ticket from the pawn shop and make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never... Said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off me before two months passed, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in the lug, to stop it being forfeited. He left me with some brass to pay for it. But really? Why on earth would Victor have done such a thing? Supposing his overcoat with the palm broken before the arrival of the police. It makes no sense at all. There would seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What Mr. Gilden had in the driver deposit at Windy Banks was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that he let me go, so I logged it off and the copper showed up. Well done, Gina. I can't have been easy to tell the truth like that. Jenny's really putting their faith in you, Renault. Yes, and to thank her, she'll have to face the charge of perjury once this trial's over. So I need to use the time we have now to get as much information out of her as possible. Time to really go for it. Press her on every statement. I suppose I should. Oh, and another thing. What's that? Take a look at those two. Isn't it strange that they've been whispering to each other the entire time? Yes, that's strange. It looks like they are having a secret discussion about something. I'm not sure I'm completely comfortable with that. I wonder if there's anything I can do about it. Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Grigson and Mr. McGraden? Inspector Mr. Graydon. Blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack. You have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us, what is the discussion about? Discussion? With this fella? Pull the other one, Sunshine. You think I got anything to talk about with a shady gent like this? 
and I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc was rightfully mine. But they've clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. Thank you, Miss Lestrade. Thank you, Council. I've heard enough. I believe we now have a reasonable understanding of what actually transpired on the Omnibus. It would appear on that night two months ago, a negotiation was taking place on the Omnibus. Negotiations concerning the disc. However, matters did not ruin, run smoothly when the part, parties involved began to quarrel over price. My guild took what they wanted by force at the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point. The disc is clearly extremely valuable in some way. Although I don't understand why as of yet. Okay, okay, I'm curious about that. And two years, two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, Miss Gilded Code and its contents were due to be forfeited. I don't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cove died right after its trial. I knew that. So he decided we'd try to claim the articles as your own. Well, why not, eh? They were, the, they were only going to be forfeited. Why should I have got them? Anyway, you can blame me for thinking about it. Thinking about it. Thinking ain't no crime. Miss Lestrade, it would appear Mr. McGildred was prepared to kill in order to take possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? Eh? I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of brass. He was probably going to sell it. You can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking that it ain't no crime. Hmm. My lord! The evidence your lordship requested has been located and is ready for the court's inspection, sir. Here we are. The mysterious little box deposited by Mr. Gilda two months ago. There's no doubt about my mind that's a key piece of this far-reaching puzzle. Do we continue? Okay. Ever double save? Here we are. So this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposited with the pawnbroker by Mr. Gilder two months ago. And on the night of the Mr. Winniebank's murder, the only item in the shelves that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. Quick, quick, let's open it and see what's inside. Probably nothing. Good gracious, this is no ordinary box, it seems. Wow, although, in truth, I had an inkling that it might be the case. It would appear that the box houses a miniature music box movement. Then, is it too much to expect? I think it would be reasonable to assume that this is the device for the playback of this disc, my lord. So, here we have the means to play back Mr. McGilder's disc, deposited at the Windy Banks as much at the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not Mr. McGilder's disc, it was the disc of its victim in the omnibus. But why, for heaven's sake? Are we to understand the brickmaker was trying to sell this music box to Mr. McGildred? Hi! I believe the answer will become clear if we listen to the music on the disc, my lord. Yes, very well. Let's the court now listen to this curious disc at last. Wait, my lord! Good grief! What is the meaning of this? Inspector! The music box and the disc are, uh, well, they're unrelated to the case. No need to spoil the somber atmosphere in the courtroom while some silly bit of music. Objection. This this may be really motivated the culprit in the case to commit murder. Clearly there's every chance that it's fundamentally important to understand what happened. Brilliant defense lawyering. Prosecution has no objection. But no, no, that piece of evidence is police property now. You can't. Clearly Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. But it's policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored. And you, Inspector, have no jurisdiction to prevent it from happening. <laughs> Here we go. No further delays, please. Play the disc. Play the disc. It's 
It's Morse. What on earth? It's certainly not what I would call music. No. It's just the same note playing over and over again in a regular sequence. Hmm. <laughs> Mr. Graydon. This. This is really priceless. After all that, the music box is broken. It's not broken. It can't be. It can't. Well, obviously, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised. If the officer said to fetch it, didn't drop it on the way back to the courtroom. Well, with much regret. I feel this court must accept that this music box offers little in the way of clues. Are you ready to move on, counsel? Come on. Yes, all right. It does sound as though it's completely broken, but is it? Could this music emanating from the music box possibly be a new clue? It's definitely a clue. I believe that it could be relevant, my lord. Good lord, but but how can it be? An abomination council, mere, mere noise. I fail to see how it could be any meaning whatsoever. It does sound strange, I agree. But there's one thing bothering me. While Grayson stands at the cordling victoriously, the inspector beside him has a rather telling expression of his face. It's as if Grayson recognizes the sound, as he's familiar with it somehow. And that's making him appear extremely on edge. If that's the stance of the defense, my Nipponese friend, answer me this. Oh. If the defense has belief that the sound emanating from this music box is broken and unusual, then not supposed to be music. Just because this is a music box doesn't necessarily mean the sounds we're hearing are music. Look at that. The smile vanished from Graydon's lips as soon as I said it. I'm on the right lines here. I must be. Okay, making deductions based on how people react to what you say. You're acting just like Hurley, Runa. Objection! The sounds we're hearing aren't necessarily music. Well, now that you've told us what they are not. I'm sure the court would like to hear what they are. Do enlighten us, my Nipponese friend. Well, um, surely I have an idea in mind, because if not, it will be the death of your ill-formed argument. Exactly. The music box is clearly broken. Refusing to accept that, in fact, is pure foolishness. They've got me. I don't know what the answer is. Yet. Um, Runo. I've just examined the music box very thoroughly. And I'm fairly certain that it's not broken at all. Can I look at the music box? No, I can't. Really? Really? The way it's been made, it can only produce a single note anyway. Thank you, Iris. All right, well, if the music box isn't broken, it must mean that the sounds it's producing have some significance that isn't musical. Ah, could it be? Is this what the sounds are? Something just struck me, Bruno. I feel like recently in the past few hours, even. I've heard another sound very much like this one this music box makes. Yes, it's a familiar sound. Actually, Iris, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. Went out to press the defense for an answer. If your assertion is that the sound produced by the music box is not in fact music at all, then what the devil is it, counsel? All the evidence we've seen so far, all the testimony we've heard. It's all pointing to a single answer now. Prosecution demands that my learned Nipponese friend present proof now. Tangible proof of the latest wild speculation. All right then, this could be the best chance I'm going to get to fight to the back of this trial. And I'm right, it's gonna join all the dots together. The evidence that explains the true nature of the sounds on the music box is... 
Evidence. Fuck. I want to talk to the lady. She would know. Okay. Honestly, what's been going at me is I thought that was the Morse code and I thought I could present a lady for it. So let's let's go with each piece of evidence slowly here. Armband doesn't matter. Now the pawnbroker's ticket. Paper Council. The headline is Palm Broker Parishes and Pick Purse Plunder. Hardly supportive of your cause. Ah, no, my lord. I was hoping you'd look at a little further down the page. Further down? Ministry Mole. Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Yes, this is a very serious matter being investigated at the highest level, I understand. I have heard that the international transmissions along supposedly secure lines are somehow being intercepted and leaked to various other countries. And presumably those transmissions are in the form of wire telegrams. Of course. Just near journal number five, your input, please. Stop. Oh, me, sir. What is ever the matter? You told the court before that you worked the same communication station as Mr. Graydon, did you not? Yes, that's correct. And the particular station where you work deals with government communications and newspaper reports. Oh, yes, we're not your run-of-the-mill communication station at all. Our work is extremely important. Then tell me, is this not a very familiar sound? You don't mean to say, is it? That's right, madame. It bears more of a passing resemblance to the sound made by your telegraph machine as you tap it. That was not the mess that I think I would actually get to her, but I got to her. I believe it's called Morse code. But I don't believe it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to leaking telegrams from government departments, there could be nobody more perfectly placed than a highly skilled communications officer. Are you suggesting that the music boss sticks contains stolen government secrets in Morse code? Order, order, please everyone, order. But this, this is the High Treason Council deserving capital punishment. Too much new vocabulary. What is treason? What is capital punishment? The sort of the words I have to expect you to know. For our sovereign government's confidential information, hostile nations would surely pay almost any price. Yes, and on that night two months ago, that was the very negotiation that was taking place inside the omnibus. But in the end, McGildred perished. And the all-important disc lay unclaimed to the pawnbroker. 
my word. In which case, whoever stole the information in the first place must surely have been beside himself with worry. Because of the disc would have been discovered before it found its way out of the country. It would reveal an act of high treason punishable by death. So the culprit had no choice but to retrieve it. And in order to do that, he would have to gain entry into the pawnbroker illegally in the middle of the night. Because the article left behind by Mr. McGilgrick would incriminate them too much to get into the wrong hands. Isn't that right, Mr. Graydon? You, you think I've been stealing government secrets. Preposterous, absolutely preposterous. So in response to the defense's accusation, you claim complete innocence, do you? Well, of course I do. I have to stand here in silence while that pretentious foreign lawyer has been prating away. Objection! Then, by all means, counter the charges, sir. The prosecution demands the witness testifies. And the response to the accusations brought by the defense. Oh, oh delighted, I'm sure. The witness is reminded about the crime under the scrutiny in this trial of the murder of pawnbroker, Mr. Winnie Bain, by being most flagitious. Fuck. <laughs> like, flagitious offense for which the law has led the sanctions accountable for one act. But his heinous act of high treason is no less serious a crime. I urge you to bear in mind that you testify, Mr. Graydon. So then, let us proceed, you may. You gotta let us have a rabbit of park here, Governor. We got things to say. I beg your pardon, who, who do you think you are? Name's Nat Skulkin, occupation is professional baddie. Name's Ringo Skulkin, but we ain't baddies enough to sell out our mother's man. That's right, we what they call... The Three Skulkin Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him again. Bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. A mere communications officer couldn't possibly steal confidential governmental information. Besides, the sounds produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. With some low-class brickmaker negotiating with McGildred anyway, was it not? I have no relation to the man. Look, all we done is break into the gaff the other night. We, like, we, like, what he told us to do. If we'd known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it. Um, Mr. Mr. Skulkin? Ah, one Mr. will do, Governor. What's up? Do I take it that you now admit to the crime? That on the night in question, you did indeed gain entrance to the premise illegally. And moreover, you did so as a party of three, in collaboration with Mr. Graydon here. You fucked up. You fucked up. We did, Gov. We did. You fucked up. Oh, no. Quiet down, please. What do you say to that, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two ruffians are referring to. You little odd we're getting this mixed up with all this monkey business. You said never said nothing about no government secrets. It was supposed to be straight up job. And what about the geezer whose shop it was, eh? Poor old bloke didn't have to die, did he? Nice to know your friends are. Whatever these men say, I deny the accusations. Indeed. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting to see this little music box that become so significant in the proceedings. However, as it has, I will admit it's to the court record as evidence. Small music box was entered in the court record. We need to examine that box. Oh, what is it, Runo? I've just noticed something about this music box. It looks like the bottom opens up as well. Ah, you're right. Well, come on then, what are you waiting for? Let's open it. All right then, here goes. Look at that, there's another movement on the other side. So does that mean you can set another disc to play back on this side? Yes, I think so, and it looks like the two movements are linked together. They're linked, so if you have two discs, they would both play back at the same time. Object. 
Oh, no, no, no. I guess I just gotta press everything like I've been doing. Who would have thought there would be a second movement under the underside of the box? And this movement is like the other one. The comb's teeth are all the same length. So, this movement is also only produces a single tone like the other one. Yes, it must do. Except that the length of the teeth on the two combs isn't the same. So the single tone produced by this movement will be different to the single tone we've already heard. What? Basically, each movement can only produce a single note. But the notes that they produce are different. These two books have only played two tones. So is this newspaper headline accurate? Government communications are being intercepted. How could I possibly know? What do you mean by that? Any important government communications are handled with high-level officers by specialists. General members of the staff at the station where I work would never be entrusted with such sensitive information. Oh no, stop. Must I say something? Stop. Let me guess. Juror number five. We regular communication stations officers aren't as lowly as you're being led to believe. A team of us are responsible for setting up and testing the telegraphs used by the ministry. And Mr. Graydon is the team leader. That's fascinating. <laughs> Graydon is a highly skilled operator. Stop. Currently in presence of Idol. Stop. <gasps> so you had access to the equipment used for these confidential communications, Mr. Graydon. Well, what of it? The transmissions are always made behind closed doors so they can't be heard. In any case, all the messages sent are enciphered. Normal employees couldn't possibly understand them. Oh no, stop. Must say something. Stop. Mr. Grady regularly attends meetings with the Ministry of Technicians and Ministry of Communications team. <laughs> Use system in ensuring that there are no errors in important international communications. And he's received the top prize at the Cyber Tracking Convention five years in a row now. <laughs> That's fascinating. Grady is a highly skilled operator. Stop. Currently in presence of idols. Stop. Well, your idol would appreciate it if you keep your shut <laughs> If you just shut the fuck up. I'll tell you this lawyer's accusations are completely unfounded. Hold it. They're not. To anyone with enough brain, that would be highly blatantly apparent unless listening to the music box for even a few seconds. Of course, of course. Surely it can't be that my learned friend is unfamiliar with Morse code. Ouch, he looks genuinely shocked at my ignorance. Ha ha ha. would be more than happy to demonstrate with the basics for you, sir. A lesson! Here in court! Morse code is a continuous series of two distinct tones. Tones, you say? Yes, a short dot. And a long dash. By combining those in different ways, you can truck letters. I see. For example, this is A. And this is B. But when you listen to the sound produced by this music box, you only hear one tone, don't don't you? But it sounds so similar, the rhythm is the same in everything. But there's no discernible meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. So your assertion is fundamentally flawed. This is not Morse code. <laughs> really, you shouldn't be so surprised. What did I tell you? That music box is nothing but a worthless piece of scrap. Perhaps you might consider studying your subject matter before casting aspirations in the future. Ugh, stop. Nothing to say, but stop. Oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Iris, I mean, if the government secrets were somehow being leaked using the music box, so many other things would slot into place so nicely. Could there still be something I haven't considered? Would it really be impossible for you to use this music box somehow to play back Morse code? There's still every possibility that the music box was instrumental in leaking the government secrets. That's a belief of defense, at least. Tactical save. Objection. 
Corruption. Does it please you in some way, my Nipponese friend? To repeat the same line of argument and infinitive. It's already been established that it has to be morph code. Two tones are required. Dots and dashes. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Then what? Well, it would appear that the defense has a hypothesis to put forward. You had better present your idea at once, Council. How do you propose that this music box, which appears to produce only a single tone, could have been used to cipher secret messages into the Morse code? Look at that, there's another movement on the other side. So, does that mean... It's another just to play back on it. Got it! Got it! Good gracious, what am I looking at here? Another movement on the underside of the music box. What? It appears, my lord, that the two movements are linked together. In other words, you can put two discs in the music box, and the sounds of both will play back at the same time. Good heavens. And the court has heard Morse code comprises of two tones, a short dot and a long dash. With a second disc in place, this music box can be used to generate Morse code and convey a message. This is beyond a joke. I'm sorry. This poor excuse for a lawyer has absolutely no evidence to support his claims. Though, of course, if I learned Fred were able to present the court with the second disc, that would be another matter. Well? Yeah, this was where I was kind of stopping and during the, the thing. Where is the second disc? I can't at the moment. Hmm. And may I remind the court that as the witness has pointed out, he was not the one in the omnibus with Gilder two months ago, striking a deal over the disc or discs. Indeed, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. Exactly. I had nothing whatever to do with it. Though it assholes, I must admit the argument presented by the defense has much promise. I believe the cross-examination should continue. The link between Graydon and the victim of the omnibus case must be there somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Oh dear. Looks like you need to give your argument more strength, Runo. You will reiterate your testimony if you please, Mr. Graydon. If I must, though I maintain exactly what I did at the start of this pointless cross-examination. Hold it! So two months ago in that omnibus, Mr. Gilder killed the brickmaker and stole the disc. Mr. Mason was a single man with almost nothing in his name. It seems he lived in Artisan Quarter some years ago, but people there remember a little about him. That doesn't make much sense, though, does it? How would a humble brickmaker come to acquire secret government information? How indeed? There must have been somebody else involved behind the scenes of all of this. Somebody who acquired the disc and gave it to Mr. Mason. In order to take it to the meeting with Mr. McGilder to negotiate a deal. Dear me. You may have it in for me, sir. But I assure you, I have far more class than that. An old brickmaker from Artisan Quarter and this well-to-do communications officer. If only I could find some evidence to link the two of them together. If you have nothing more to add on that note, let us return to the witness testimony. I've heard that one before, Zero. Like Mr. Graydon told you to do, you mean? That's it. Yeah. Who else, eh? Silly me thought it was just popping over for a mat for a natter after all them years, but the rotter dodged job for us. Ash. Let me stop you there, Mr. Skulkin. After all of them years, you say. Do you mean to tell me that Mr. Graydon is an acquaintance of yours? We, the social economy kind of baddies, you know. Sure, let's say Graydon's in old China. Excuse me. Is something wrong, Skulkin? Eh? No, the other one. <laughs> what? Who? Oh, me? When your brother was testifying just now, he said something that seemed to cause you to react. Oh, I was just remembering the old days. That's all. 
We used to have a red old laugh together way back when. Together with Mr. Graydon, you mean? Yeah, with Ash, I mean. I'm now in the fancy whistle of my flute. You wouldn't have an eve it. But when he was younger, he was from a poor part of town just like us. Is that so? But we always a leery one. And the brains, and the savvy. Always coming up with smart ideas like what would never have gone through in our heads. Gone blimey, ain't that the truth? Remember, military and Skulk and Milkrun? That was Corker, eh? Save it until after the trial. Your remnant has no place in this courtroom. And neither does your fruit. Oh yeah, that user asked us a question, didn't he? And we was answering. Yeah, we ain't done nothing wrong. Nevertheless, the court is not prepared to accompany you on your trip down memory lane. Counsel, can we turn our attention back to the testimony, please? I don't know. Could that sentimental story be relevant somehow? Add it to the testimony. My lord? Yes, counsel. The brother's last sentimental statement could hold vital information relating to this case. Very well, counsel. I will permit the brothers to supplement their testimony with that detail. Briefly, I hate to add. Say no more. Skulkin's never Skulkin. Hold it! I'm sure I'm going to regret asking, but... What exactly was that? Some kind of business. Just a little scheme we had going back when we was youngsters. Bit of fun, really. <laughs> the refreshment of the locals, that's what it all was about. That sounds alarmingly legitimate. There must be a catch. I suppose since we're here, I should ask him to elaborate, but on what? Who cares about the name? So this business was just a bit of fun, you say? And it was just yourselves and Mr. Graydon involved? Yeah, that's it. Milverton and Skulkin's Milk Run, was it? Yeah, that's it. And where did the Milverton part come from? Oh, right. I thought a clever cog's like, yeah, you have worked out one out. That is... I fucking knew it. Enough of it. How much longer are we expected to listen to this drivel? I don't. Let me guess. You don't accept anything on these two witnesses are saying. Tell me, why is that it was the only at the mention of the name Milverton that you decided to interject? Because I, well... It, it weren't the happiest uh, ohms that one came from. Yeah, his old man was struggling for money as such. His wife walked out on him. She took the name Graydon then, see? But Ash will always be a Milverton to us. Milverton. So that used to be your surname, did it? Of course not. This is all bunkum. Bunk, bunkum. I've been great in there ever since I was born. Do you really think you can rely on the testimony of those two thieves, huh? Your communications officer attached to the civil service. As such, your personal details will have been thoroughly checked at the time of your appointment. It would be a very simple matter indeed to subpoena those records, Mr. Graydon. Well, it would appear that Mr. and Mr. Skulkin's testimony has been reliable. For once. You are born Ashley Milverton, then. Is that correct? Very well, yes. So Ashley Graydon was once Ashley Milverton. That information could change the things, and it could turn out to be extremely important. All of a sudden, we seem to be up our necks in a serious matter of national security. Although all this talk about interception of secret government message is still just conjecture at this stage. I learned to the past, you could say. Been a number of things, though, wasn't it? Negotiating Guinea overheard on the omnibus two months ago, and the breaking at Windybanks. 
But the trouble is, it wasn't Mr. Graydon the Omnibus with Mr. Gildred. No, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker who was so horribly murdered. Hmm. Only there was some link between the two men somehow. I know. Mr. Graydon's testimony seems to be as watertight as ever. I wonder if the key to us making headway is the cross-examination here. Could those two brothers... Mr. Ashley Milverton. Tell me, why did you try to hide your former name from the court? A Link to the Past, only on Super Nintendo. Speaking of uh, old retro consoles, we might, if it's here, play Sonic Spinball today. I've never beaten the game. And it's getting released. No, I don't think that's a real explanation at all. The truth is, you had a reason to hide that name. Explain yourself, please, counsel. I have here the notes on the Omnibus case, my lord. And as we all know, the victim, the man who we now understand has been negotiating with Mr. McGildred. Yes, Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. That's right. Only Mason wasn't his surname at all. It was his given name. His full name was Mason Milverton. Milverton? Do you mean to say, Saints Alive? Mr. Ashley Milverton, is it not the case that the brickmaker, Mr. Mason Milverton, was your father? Uh, I don't. As I believe I mentioned earlier, your family history will have been thoroughly checked when you join the civil service. And it really would take no time at all for the court to subpoena those records. The truth is you have been illegally acquiring highly confidential government information. And selling it to Mr. McGilden in collaboration with your father. Whoo! Spicy! Back in a second, I'm gonna do something...